podcast. Yes, Jim. Good evening, and thank you for tuning in to another edition of, as the sign behind me says, What Do You Think? This is a call-in program. We touch on different subjects from week to week. We are generally here every Thursday from 545 to 630. As I said, this is a call-in program. You call in via a Zoom arrangement in the call-in uh, data or the phone number will be listed below shortly, the lower part of the screen. And so feel free to call in any time. We have two callers with us at this time. And uh, <clears throat> again, uh, welcome to everyone and welcome to the first day of July. This is the first of July, 2021. And as we did last week, we're going to go back in time 
and uh, stay with one person this time instead of going through a newspaper and uh, covering different topics. We're going to stay with a gentleman that was the governor of Vermont from 1937 to 1941, and later was the senator, one of the two senators from Vermont from 1941, once he finished his first term, his only term, I believe, as governor, uh, to, unless the uh, two two-year terms, then it would be the end of his second term. I have a feeling it's two years, I believe it is two years, uh, term here in Vermont for a governor. I should know that by heart, but uh, I'm pretty sure I'm right. So at the end of his second term, he, uh, in 1941, he ran for the Senate. He won, and uh, he was a senator uh, through a very interesting time in our history. <clears throat> he was senator through uh, the 50s, that through the war, World War II, uh, through the post-war period, through the 50s and the 60s, and he uh, decided to not run in 1975. And what we're going to do is look through uh, excerpts or entries is a better word, entries, some of the daily entries that he wrote down in his uh, diary from 1972 to uh, 1975 when he returned to Putney, Vermont, which was his home. And again, I haven't mentioned his name. His name is George Aiken, Governor George Aiken, Senator George Aiken. A little brief bio on him. He was uh, born in Dummerston, outside of Brattleboro. He went to Brattleboro High School I don't know where he studied higher education, but I know that he was a horticulturist. If you uh, looked on his resume for profession, he would have written down farmer. He was a farmer. He considered himself a farmer. And of course, a statesman. And um, he spent most of his life, when he wasn't in Washington, he was in uh, Putney. So. Um, Anyway, we're going to look at these excerpts from the New England Magazine section of the Sunday Boston Globe. This is the magazine section from the Sunday Boston Globe, dated June 13th, 1976. June 13th, 1976. So these diary uh, entries uh, are coming out a couple of years after his um, decision not to run again for re-election to the Senate. So, uh, gentlemen, I'm curious your feedback. What do you expect to hear about in his uh, comments or in his diary entries? Uh, Fred, do you want to go first? Just off the cuff, what do you think he's going? What do you think is going to come at us from his diary entries? Well, you know, I, I don't know much about the governor's senator, um, you know, but I'm hoping that what I'm going to hear is is that of a statesman and a public servant, you know, and and reflections and maybe advice for the future. Okay, good, fair enough. And Kurt, what would you expect to hear from uh, George Aiken, governor slash senator, in these uh, diary entries? Honestly, I don't have a clue. Same same answer as Fred. I mean, he was really kind of outside of my years. Strangely enough, he went to the same high school my mother went to. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, honestly, I don't I don't have a clue. I recall his name from earlier years but uh, really don't know much about the politician. Obviously, he's a, a long-lasted politician, so hopefully uh, he was successful for Vermont. Okay. Yes, I, I think both those answers are pretty much on target. Uh, one of the reasons I'm sharing these entries is because, uh, at least my choice of the entries, not all of them, but my choice of the entries is that I think they show a pretty balanced person 
and someone who I would wonder, had he been in office today, what would he do, what would he say, uh, how would he act, who would be his allies, and who would he be very careful with? Um, I'm just curious because there were, there as, as with the newspaper articles in previous editions of the show, I see parallels between topics that were very hot 40, 50, 60 years ago and what we've been experiencing over the last couple of years. So hence, that's why I thought it would be relevant to share with you and with anyone else who's watching or who'd care to call in uh, some of what was in George Aiken's head uh, during the time of the early 70s when so much was happening in the country. And uh, it was a, uh, they were years of reckoning on various levels. So what I'm going to read are excerpts from the book Aiken, Senate Diary, January 1972 to January 1975. All right, and these were written by George Aiken himself. These are diary entries. So, January 1st, 1972. Every president with whom I have been associated, and there were quite a few, uh, has wanted to be a good president. In fact, I think each wanted to be the best president the country ever had, and President Nixon was no exception, is no exception. January 27th. Uh, guys, if you want to stop me anytime, that's fine. January 27th, 1972. Although for 30 years I have supported the cause of labor, organized and unorganized, I feel that there are many labor leaders in this country who are altogether too big for their bridges and whose principal motive is to promote their own ambitions at the expense of the membership of their unions and of other factors of our economy. Interesting. Labor leadership has changed drastically since the days of Phil Murray, John L. Lewis, John Edelman, and others who were sincerely dedicated to the cause. Now briefly stopping, I recognize the name John L. Lewis uh, Fred or Kurt, do either of you recognize the names Phil Murray or John Edelman? Those two, no. No. Same, same here. Okay, just curious. If I remember, uh, I'm, I'm going to look them up to see what roles they play. Okay. Um, I well recall, this is another entry for the same date. I well recall that when I came to the Senate in 1941, I was told by competent politi political and economic leaders that when our national debt reached 50 billion, the country would collapse. It didn't. <laughs> I just found that an interesting comment because uh, what is our current debt right now in the United States, uh, 20 trillion or something like that, or 12 trillion? Either of you fellas have an idea? I think it's around 23. 23 trillion? Does that yeah. sound about that's right, Fred? Yeah, that's only money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's just call it a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. January 29th, 1972. Uh, again, this is going to move quickly because there are lots of days where there's no entry or no entry that's been published. Again, and I'm not reading all of them, of course. January 29th, 1972, the president exploded what might be termed another blockbuster by divulging the terms of proposals which had been made secretly to the North v Vietnam government for ending the war in Indochina. I can support his proposal and commend him for it the next day, although, and commended him for it the next day, although it is doubtful that North Vietnam will accept, since that country insists that we overthrow the government of South Vietnam as a condition for ending the war. Should Viet North Vietnam ever get control of South Vietnam, 
I dread to think of the slaughter that will take place. All right, so pretty, uh, pretty dismal outlook there. Uh, February 19th, 1972, LPA. Now, LPA stands for Lola P Pierotti Aiken, who was his second wife. Uh, George Aiken was married twice. Uh, this time in his life, he was married to uh, LPA or Lola Pierotti Aiken. So we'll just say LPA like he's uh, marked here. We arrived home in Putney, Vermont, just before the biggest blizzard of the winter to find our house had been broken into and a great many articles carried away. The people who broke into our house probably were motivated by the same instincts that prompt a big corporation to overthrow the government of a small country and preempt its resources. I found that I, I found that quite a comparison. <laughs> Amazing parallel. Yeah, I, I, that's that's why I started warming up to this guy. <laughs> um, some of his uh, some of his um, insight. Anyway, moving on. March third, nineteen seventy two. The Friday session of the Senate was not a happy one. There were difficulties in getting a quorum. Forty two members were absent, except for two or three cases of illness. The members were out on the road playing politics, many campaigning for their own reelection, which would be November 7th, and others taking part in the campaign for the nomination and election of a president. This was also an election year for the president. Most of the congressional candidates for the presidency have, in my opinion, eliminated any possible excuse for voting for them next fall. That's interesting. I still can't see what there is about neglecting their duties that qualifies them for a higher office. <laughs> I, I thought that's spot on. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, a number of entries from March 11th. We'll just read one, 72. Last year, the Congress enacted two pieces of legislation which I am not proud to have voted for. One was a new tax law ostensibly to help low-income people, but which at present seems to be having the opposite effect. The other bit of legislation enacted last year was supposed to ensure clean elections. I also voted against it because I knew on the face of it that it wouldn't work, but finally went along with the rest of the Senate and voted for it. I would feel better today had I voted against this so-called clean election bill and the new tax law. The national election due next November promises to be anything but clean, and the loopholes in the tax bill and benefits to big business are enabling the corporations to go a long way in their efforts to influence or purchase the election outright. <laughs> At this point, lack of money seems to be no obstacle for the major candidates of either party. All right, so April 15th, 1972. LPA and I attended dinner at the White House given by President Nixon for the foreign ministers and ambassadors of the OAS, or Organization of American States. About nine o'clock, I was tipped off that American planes in force had bombed Haiphong Harbor and that the press would be looking for me after the dinner. I well recall being with the small group at the White House in 1966 when President Johnson announced a decision to bomb Haiphong and Hanoi. I protested as vigorously as I could over this decision because I felt that such action would only prolong the war, which has proven to be the case. 
1966, we were clearly the aggressors, carrying aerial bombing and its resultant destruction to the country of North Vietnam. The situation is quite different today, with North Vietnamese committing virtually every bit of military strength they possess to the conquering of South Vietnam. North Vietnam apparently is adequately supplied with invasion weapons, mostly from Russia, whereas our supplies sent to the South Vietnamese troops have consisted primarily of defensive weapons. I believe that Hanoi committed a serious effort, and if, as is reported, Russia has been egging them on, then the Soviets are only creating more difficulties for themselves. Probably we won't know for sure for an another two months what the outcome will be, but at this point I feel that Hanoi has made a serious error. There can be no comparison between the bombing of Haiphong Harbor today and the bombing of North Vietnam under President Johnson. As I have said many times, I felt that the war in Vietnam could be concluded by midsummer. This is midsummer 1972, and our withdrawal completed with reasonably acceptable terms. It now looks as though there are people who are determined that our exodus from that unhappy region shall not be concluded until after the election. The theory being that the Democratic candidate for president will have a much better chance for election if President Nixon can be charged with failure to end our involvement. I am not sure that their hopes of extending our involvement until November will be realized. Okay. Uh, you're going to see a pattern here. We're going to shift, as you can guess, from Vietnam to another subject in the coming months, <clears throat> especially after the election. The Senate, May 13, 1972. The Senate leaders, Hugh Scott and Mike Mansfield, Mike Mansfield's name, I, that rings a bell, asked President Nixon to invite us for an up-to-date briefing. Before extending the invitation, however, the president had announced that he would go on the air and speak to the country at 9 p.m. What he told us was that he had decided to mine Haiphong Harbor and all other harbors on the North Vietnam coast, that he planned to destroy railroads, depots, and highways in North Vietnam in the belief that crippling all forms of transportation would force North Vietnam to ask for peace. I was not surprised at this decision, but I felt he was taking a desperate risk for ending the war. I had heard such decisions several times under President Johnson, and none of them succeeded. They only made things worse. I don't believe that mining the coast and bombing the interior will work. There is only an outside chance that it may. Some members of Congress who attended the President's briefing seemed shocked. Senator Mansfield was mad and made no bones about it. After the president left, the briefing was continued by Secretary of State Rogers, Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird, and Admiral Moore. Uh, Thomas Moore was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I left early and heard the president on the car radio. I believe everybody there felt depressed, but not as much as I did. All right, we're now in the summer of 72, July 9th, recess. We have been in Vermont a week now, and half of our so-called vacation is gone. 
am writing this at 6 o'clock Sunday morning, July 9th. Like Harry Truman, I have never been able to break myself of waking up around 5.30 in the morning. Being raised on a farm is one way to get this lifetime habit. In the field below, which we cleared from the woods and sowed to rye and grass last year, a big woodchuck is wandering around helping himself to young clover and any other plants which may tickle his palate. LPA and I went to Mount Pelier last Tuesday, and when we returned to Putney Thursday, we found that Mr. Chuck and his wife had been in our garden and eaten the leaves off our pumpkins, squashes, and beans. Fortunately, they hadn't stripped them completely, and I closed the gap in the wire fence so that, so that they may not get in again. All right, so a little pause or relief in the Washington drama, and uh, I think he kept his sanity. Again, for people just tuning in, we're talking about diary entries from Governor and later Senator George Aiken of Vermont. So uh, it was a uh, part of therapy, <laughs> uh, his garden. Okay, July 15th, 1972. Sunday, correction. Saturday afternoon is hot, but we have to leave Vermont. Our parole is over. Two yearling deer have paid their respects to us by standing beside the road to watch us go by. I hope the dogs don't get them. Mm. All right. August 12th, 1972, back in Washington. All right, we're starting to shift gears here and change focus. Uh, the raid on the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate a few weeks ago smells to high heaven. And the political world apparently believes, as of today, that this despicable and fruitless act was planned within the headquarters of the committee to reelect the president, President Nixon. While complete proof has not been shown, there is a general feeling that it will be shown before election time and will be costly in terms of votes for Republican candidates. How true that will be. Uh, All right, this is interesting. It's a little bit longer, but I think it's worth it. September 30th, 1972. On Thursday, I came on the floor just in time to note that Senator Edward Brooke uh, of Massachusetts, is that Brooke or Kennedy? I just noticed that. Did it's probably Brooke. Probably Brooke. All right, thanks, Fred. I'm not aware of him, but thank you. I am now that Senator Edward Brooke of Massachusetts and Senator Alan Cranston of California were offering what is called the End the War Amendment to the Clean Water Bill. The Senate previously had agreed that no non-germane amendments could be offered to legislation for the rest of the session. That sounds familiar. But Senators Brooke and Cranston, with only three or four of their non-hostile colleagues being on the floor, apparently thought that they could get unanimous consent to void the rule and slide this amendment through before their effort could be noted. If I had not come on the floor just as I did, their ruse might have succeeded. Both Senator Sam Irvin of North Carolina, who came on the floor about that time, and I, we vigorously, vigorously dissented, and they were thwarted in their attempt to tack this highly controversial legislation onto a bill that was completely unrelated. Again, a clean water bill and the war. Uh, I could see his point. 
I admit that I had difficulty in controlling my thoughts and my language when I observed what I considered to be underhanded actions. I did charge them with undertaking to harass the president in his efforts to get this country out of an unsavory situation in Indochina. And the language which I used in expressing my opinion was not exactly complimentary or of a Sunday school caliber. I like his language. I remarked to one of the aides on the floor that the Senate was getting so slimy that we would have to wear rubbers, not realizing that the official reporter took down this remark, a hot mic, <laughs> as <laughs> if addressed to the Senate as a whole. I also suggested, and I think this is good, I also suggested that if anyone wanted to take the part of Hanoi in the war, they could go to Hanoi. But if they wanted to stay in the United States, they ought to act like Americans. Later on, I deleted these two rather unsavory remarks from the official record of the Senate. But unfortunately, or fortunately, according to one's viewpoint, reporters in the press gallery overheard them and use them as a basis for their news stories. No surprise there. October 2nd, 1972. The defense appropriation bill <clears throat> went through just about as submitted and now will be in conference with the House. Why does almost nobody vote against the defense appropriation bill when they know that it could be sheared down saving tax money without materially injuring our defense establishment or the security of our country? The answer is we don't know enough about the details of it or where it could be best reduced. Now this is a senator saying this, admitting this, and I can understand why. Uh, another reason is that so many of the giant corporations, including those that are well managed and those that are poorly managed, look to the U.S. government to keep them in business and keep them employing thousands of men and women, almost all of whom are members of labor organizations. The so-called defense corporations, military industrial complex, my words, and the labor unions exert tremendous power on the Senate or on Congress. Okay. Uh, October 26, having served in the Senate for nearly 32 years, I don't want to show publicly how sick I may feel with a chest cold. To appear sick might start a drool fest among those who want to volunteer for my job in the Senate. Okay. Uh, December 23rd, 1972. Any guesses as to what this diary entry will be about? Gentlemen. Fred or uh, Kurt, do you have any ideas? Does December, Christmas, 1972 ring a bell? Christmas, 1972. Yeah, I can't pull anything up there. No. Isn't that... Uh, would something have happened uh, regarding... Uh, Haldeman or somebody at that point in time? We're going back to Indochina. Oh, I thought it was last minute Christmas uh, dropping. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it wasn't it wasn't Christmas for Hanoi. Why do you think that? <laughs> All right, listen up. It's interesting. When it was announced that President Nixon had ordered a renewal of the bombing of Hanoi and Haiphong Harbor in the heaviest American air attacks of the war, the nation was stunned. And, uh, the question asked over and over was, what has happened to the man we elected as our president on November 7th? Why did he lead us to believe that a peace settlement was at most only a few weeks away? 
Is he now determined to win a military victory to show the world that we are the strongest nation on earth? Interesting. All right, December 30th. The White House announced that the bombing of North Vietnam is stopped as of today and will stay stopped. Low-level personnel of both North Vietnam and the United States will start discussions in Paris January 2nd. On January 8th, and here's a name you'll recognize, Mr. Kissinger, and we got to go through the Allen Furniture ad. There we are. Uh, Ducto and company will renew discussions, I guess Ducto was representing the North Vietnamese, will renew discussions at the higher level. Who won this 10-day bombing war? The Christmas bombing, it was so-called. This is a question which I think I can, act, I can answer factually. The White House said that we would continue the bombing until Hanoi agreed to renewed discussions. In other words, bomb them to the negotiations table. Hanoi said that they would not renew discussions until we stopped the bombing. <laughs> Did both sides win? <clears throat> Did both sides save face? Not in my opinion. Both sides lost heavily. And the next meeting in Paris represents a mutual, these are his words, uh, Senator Aiken, a mutual surrender party, which ought not to have necessarily taken place. All right. Uh, January 27th, 1973, uh, Monday night, Lyndon Johnson died. The 36th president of the United States was a powerful, although debatable, character. As majority leader in the Senate, he was dictatorial and influenced the votes of the Democratic members. Elected vice president in 1960, he never seemed very close to President Kennedy and the White House. But when Johnson became president after the death of President Kennedy in November 1963, Lyndon Johnson really came into his own. He was the president, and although he had his confidential advisors, I always felt that he made his own decisions. I was at the White House frequently when some of these decisions were announced. Some of them were good, and some of them were mistakes. Lady Bird Johnson, his wife, is one of the strongest characters I have ever known, and it goes without saying that she must have been largely responsible for the success that Lyndon Johnson made of his life. It's an interesting statement. I don't mind, I don't mean, I don't mean that she determined government policy or even slanted it. What I mean is that Lady Bird must have been responsible for keeping the emotions of her husband under control and extending to him the sympathy and understanding which he must have needed during the difficult periods of his life and tenure of office. Uh, just a side note, I believe it's um, the reason that Lyndon Johnson did not seek re-election in 1968 was uh, over in Vietnam. He was unsuccessful in completing our mission of um, safeguarding the southern part of Vietnam and uh, I think he was exhausted. He, um, he only died five years afterwards. He died only five years afterwards. So I think he was just exhausted. Uh, if you see pictures of him uh, after he was president, he started hair, growing his hair down shoulder length, and he was just coasting until it was time to go. Anyway, my impression. March 31st, 1973. Uh, 
Another matter of partisan interest has been the Democrats continuing to make hay on the Watergate episode. Apparently, the Republican bigwigs never heard of a counterattack. Otherwise, they certainly would have come back and accused the Democrats, some of them pretty well known, of breaking into Republican offices previous to the election of last fall. <laughs> the White House crew has acted very stupidly, politically speaking, in resisting the demand of Senator Irwin's committee to testify on the subject like other people who would be called upon to testify. The White House should be demanding an opportunity to testify before this committee uh, looking into Watergate break-in in order to clear up the situation and exonerate the administration if, as it claims, it is not guilty. Fair enough. Unless the bunch at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue shows more sense soon, a lot of Republican candidates are going to be in very severe difficulties for a good many years to come. Uh, certainly with presidential politics, that is true and also with Senate politics in Vermont. It is true that the public is showing comparatively little interest in Watergate at this time, any more than it is in alleged efforts of ITT to interfere in the politics of Chile. 1973, uh, you may remember, a socialist candidate or socialist president, elected president, um, Salvador Allende was uh, disposed of, for lack of a better word, by uh, General Pinochet. And General Pinochet, through a coup d'etat or a military takeover, took control of uh, Chile. Okay, let's go, uh, let's see, Brezhnev. We can skip Brezhnev. All right. Um, Side note here, June 22nd, 1973. Late Thursday, Henry Kissinger met with nine members of the Foreign Relations Committee at the invitation of the chairman, uh, Fulbright. I didn't think he did as well as usual. His comments on Cambodia in particular were not satisfactory to most members of the committee. We still don't see why it is necessary to continue bombing that country, uh, Cambodia being the neighbor to Vietnam. I think the, prob the issue was the North Vietnamese were operating out of Laos and Cambodia, hence Cambodia and Laos were bombing targets. Uh, bombing the jungles is, <clears throat> is another issue though. July 7th, another event which occupied some of the press during this week was, and I'm going to skip that for time, okay, September 25th, 1973, a little levity here. On Monday, I received a letter addressed to Jesus Christ, care of George David Aiken, and boy, was I really set up. It was actually a pretty good letter about current affairs, but I am in no hurry to deliver it in person. October 10th, 73. The big news of the week, which wiped the Watergate hearings almost completely off the map and reduced the Middle East war to the middle pages of the newspapers, was the resignation of Vice President Spiro Agnew. Everyone was caught by surprise and shock when he appeared in court in Baltimore Wednesday afternoon, admitting that he, what do you think he got caught doing? Gentlemen, any ideas off the cuff? I believe it had something to do with property uh, when they were running a highway through Maryland. Okay, that's He had possible. advance notice of it. Oh, for buying up property, right. Mm-hmm getting a scoop, kind of like a stock market scoop. Right. Fred, any idea? Yeah, I mean, that sounds completely plausible. And, you know, okay. The only other thing that pops in my mind is tax evasion. But I don't you got it. Bingo. 
Really? Yeah, you got it. You get a prize, uh, but you'll have to collect it when we see each other. <laughs> well, that's fine. And, and you know, and Kurt, maybe it was uh, he didn't pay the capital gains on the property. Yeah. <laughs> he admitted that he had not paid income tax on money received in earlier years, and announced that same day that he had resigned as vice president of the United States. In other words, he didn't fight it, which does show some honor. Either that or he's afraid of them digging even further and finding out other transgressions. All right. Uh, let's see. November 3rd, 1973. Probably the most sensible letter I got from Vermont, and it said, either impeach the president or get off his back. A week later, November 10th, 1973. At noon on Wednesday, I spoke in the Senate for 15 minutes. I wound up my speech by advising Congress to what? Either impeach Nixon or get off his back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, New Year, 1974. Some of us are getting ready to graduate from high school. Maybe. <laughs> the weather is too warm for this time of year. I certainly hope that having warm weather throughout most of January doesn't mean a short crop of maple syrup this spring. We simply have to have maple syrup in this office because I found out many years ago that a quart of maple syrup wields more influence among my colleagues and friends in Washington than money could ever be expected to do. There you have it. Maple syrup is bartering chip. Ah, la, 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 la. All right. I'm going to go. We've got one more. Actually. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm going to cut it down to, yeah, okay. We're going to go to August 8th, 1974. Either of you gentlemen what, remember what happened on August 8th, 1974? Resignation. Fred, do you concur? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> of course, the big news of the week, the big sensation was the resignation of Richard M. Nixon as President of the United States. Although I had constantly opposed resignation on the president's part, preferring the impeachment process if he were found guilty of the charges made against him. My position collapsed on Monday when he admitted that statements he had been making for the last two years were not true, and that he was aware of the Watergate break-in scandal soon after it occurred. So, honor. If then, it then was obvious that he had tried to cover up the evidence and protect the guilty parties. Uh, I'm not surprised given the esprit de corps or the, the team spirit, uh, and I, I'm not saying that in a very positive sense here, but um, he saw what was in front of his face and not what was out on the horizon, for lack of a better comparison. When he made this confession, his support in the Congress rapidly dissolved. Yeah, he should have come clean immediately. Until by Thursday, he had decided that it was best for the country if he resigned. Thursday night, the president called about 15 members from each House of Congress, including myself, down to the White House to state his position. The president told us that personally, he would prefer to fight the charges made against him to the end. Well, can't do that now. That he did not like to be a quitter, but in view of many domestic and international situations that would require a full-time presidential att attention, he had decided, and wisely, that the country could not possibly meet or address its problems with a part-time president. All right, so he goes on. Uh, who took his place? Who uh, came in uh, as the next president to replace Nixon? Gentlemen? Mm -hmm. From Michigan. 
Gerald Ford. Yeah. Very good. August 10th, Gerald Ford took the office of 38th President of the United States. All right. Um, September 14th, what does Gerald Ford do that costs him a lot of support? He pardoned Nick Nixon. Is that right, Fred? Do you concur? Yeah, it, it wasn't the slice from the, the fourth hole and hitting one in the press, was it? <laughs> No, amigo. <laughs> Eso no fue el caso. <laughs> no, no siento mucho. <laughs> September 14th, 1974. Fred, you were at Avery Point. Kurt, where were you? If you mind telling us. I was at UConn. You were at UConn. Excellent. Mm -hmm. One of the most unhappy weeks of the year, with the honeymoon between President Ford and Congress and the public, getting rather badly damaged. Well, that's one way to put it. After I had been given about an hour's notice on Sunday, President Ford announced a complete pardon for ex-President Nixon, covering any sentence which Mr. Nixon might receive later on if found guilty of participating in the Watergate mess through illegal action. Since the ex-president had not been found guilty of any charges would ha which had been made against him, I was naturally somewhat surprised, as were a lot of other people in Congress and throughout the country. There is no question but that the president had the constitutional authority to grant such complete pardon, but whether such granting was premature, and I believe it was, my opinion, or not is a matter for individual opinion. I just gave mine. When called by numerous members of the press asking my opinion, I stated that the president showed a good deal of courage in granting a full pardon, since he must have known full well that he would come under very vigorous attack for his action. Well, he wouldn't be elected president, that's for sure, on his own. All right, September 28th, 1974, we were told at the White House that there would be uh, a new election in Greece early in November, but it would remain secret. I kept it secret until receiving on Friday copies of small Vermont newspapers. I found that they had the news two days before we got it at the White House about the Greek <laughs> election. That's the way it goes. <laughs> That's funny. November 26, we are a country involved up to our ears in debt, all the way from town and state up to federal government. I don't know what the answer is going to be. Well, that much hasn't changed. And the last bit. January 2nd, 1975, the last entry in the, uh, the last published entry of the diary and uh, excerpts. At the end of the week, LPA, his wife and I, my wife and I left Washington for good after having been there 34 years, lacking one week. My retirement income amounts to more than my paycheck for the last few years. I could have added 7.4% to this by resigning before midnight on December 31st. I do not choose to do so because I have always felt I should carry out contracts in full. When I came to Washington, I lost a week in the Senate because I insisted on completing my terms as governor of Vermont. I have never been sorry that I did this. When we got to the house on the mountain in Putney, we found that the neighbors had cleaned the snow off the steps. That's sweet. Now instead of looking out of the window and seeing the Capitol and the Washington Monument, we see Mount Monognac and the New Hampshire Hills in the near distance and the nearby hills of Vermont covered with one to two feet of snow. There are no deer in our yard since they have all gone back to their own yards in the woods. But the chickadees and the blue jays were on hand to meet us. Although we miss our many friends in Washington, 
Vermont is a welcome relief from the atmosphere in our nation's capital for the last few years. It is good to be home. And gentlemen, that's it. Nice. Any comments or reactions or before we sign off the air? Fred or Kirk? Good, thanks for the history lesson. No, I, I, yeah. I hope it didn't drag on too much, but I saw like five or six parallels with what's been going on today or in the last 12 to 16 months. And I thought this, this, bears, uh, this bears covering because certain things have not changed that much. And we seem to be addressing the same uh, challenges that we did in, uh, 70, in the early 70s. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. So, Fred, anything else to add? No. It's just it's great to be back with you guys, and we got dinner on the table, and I'm 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 eating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good, Fred. How about you, Kurt? Well, actually, it, uh, I recall uh, the senator's name from my earlier years, and uh, he seems to be quite a likable guy. Um, interesting uh, to hear, you know, his private con uh, comments from uh, his diary. Yes. But uh, interesting observations. Yes, yes. Uh, there is actually a uh, George Aiken building at the uh, University of Vermont campus in Burlington. I believe it deals with ecosystems. It's one of the few buildings on campus that has a roof garden and is named for uh, Governor Senator George Aiken. Uh, there's also an Aiken Center if you Google or if you duck, duck, go. Uh, George Aiken Center that I hope someday to visit because uh, he seemed like a very um, dedicated, balanced individual who uh, went by values and not party affiliations. So I'm going to say good night to both of you. Thank you for joining. And um, hopefully the three of us and more people can be together next week. So guys, have a good fourth. I wish everybody in the audience a good fourth uh, holiday weekend. And uh, we'll be talking soon again. Thanks so much. Okay. Cheers. Good night, everybody. <laughs>